Okay, we, we, we are in this series, 444, um, finishing up just a little series of four weeks, addressing four different questions that you guys have proposed to me or shared with me, unbeknownst to you that I've just been listening, to kind of hear what kind of questions you have. One question that did come up a lot that I chose not to roll with, because I've addressed it in various different angles, uh, you know, why is there suffering, Pastor Steve? And you know, gosh, I mean, that, that, that would take a lifetime to address. But you know, with respect to suffering, every, every situation we have to address with regard to the circumstance and the setting. And, you know, what were the decisions that led up to that? Um, you know, and, and there's a, you know, a person lives in Tornado Alley and a tornado comes. Well, you know, they, it, it kind of makes sense. That's how the world works. You know, if a person comes down with cancer, you know, you could probably keep going back, 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 back. Maybe an ancestor at some point, you know, partook of something or experienced something that genetically changed something that was passed on to you. I don't know. I don't have the answer to that. You know, um, if you live in a, a flood zone and it floods, well, you know, that's kind of what happens. It's not an act of God. I would argue that. I don't think God brings suffering into this world. Mm-mm. Mm-mm. And I, I, would, I would spend the, the entire message arguing that. But every element, you know, what about this instance? Right? You can often look at maybe a decision you made or a loved one made or an ancestor made or a, a human being made that went and ex from one person to another to another. It's just you know, a, a car accident. Well, you know, a person's not paying attention. And it, it, you know, we live in a world where we have freedom of choice and we make mistakes because of that opportunity that God has given us to have freedom of choice. And uh, sometimes we're just, we're careless. Accidents happen. Tragedies occur. And uh, so often innocent people are the ones who end up suffering the most, right? Um, God is with you in the suffering. But yeah, that's a rough one because I, uh, the bottom line is I don't, I don't I, this is just me, I, I do not believe that God brings suffering into this world. I do not believe that. But anyway, um, that's, I, it was, it's so convoluted and so in-depth and we're going to be asking that question, you know, but that person was so good and he suffered for so long and it's, I get it, I get it. There's so many angles in things to think about and to keep looking back behind behind why this has happened. Anyway, we're looking at the question today, which is kind of interesting because, um, I don't know, it, 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 in my mind, it's kind of like one of those um, twinky messages. Okay. I mean, that's how I think of it. A very basic, very simple. I mean, twinky, I just think of sponge and cream filling. That's it. And... Um, and it's the kind of message that, you know, is everlasting, like a Twinkie is everlasting, right? The shelf life of a Twinkie, I mean, sh shoot, you know, if I had one from my childhood, I could probably still eat it, whatever, with all the chemicals in it. But, you know, I just think real basic, um, long lasting, and that's just, I'm just going to share with you some basic things. It's like, oh, okay, well, I know all this, Steve. It's like, well, I'm glad you do. It's awesome. But every so often, it's kind of nice to just kick back for a moment and not have to think real hard, as I often challenge you on many Sundays, and just kind of take in what I'm going to share with you today, things that you've heard before, but I think something here will help you understand where I'm coming from as your teaching pastor, as your um, senior Pat, as your minister, whatever, in this capacity, as your primary teacher on Sunday mornings, okay? And the question is, that's been, and it's been various ways it's been asked to me, Steve, what do you believe when it comes to the Bible? You know? And I've been asked that question in various ways. You know, Steve, how do you perceive the Bible? How do you understand it? How do you read the Bible? What do you bring when you read the Bible? What presumptions do you bring when you read the Bible? And maybe that'll be, help you understand why I preach the way I preach. So it's kind of a 
different kind of message, but maybe it gets you thinking about how you approach the Bible with your presumptions. Okay? Okay. You should know what lies in the hot, molten core of my being, of what I deeply believe in. What's in the very core of my soul that I believe so deeply, you know, that it, it, it's in my bones. It's just, and I can't, I can't deny it. And it's going to influence how I read and interpret and understand God's word. Okay. I will say in many ways, my tower of faith, you know, visualize, and I've used this image before, of a tower of Jenga blocks. In many ways, my tower of faith that I had in my early 20s has pretty much imploded and collapsed. Okay. And it's been rebuilt in many ways. Uh, it looks like a different tower now, but with different Jenga blocks. Okay. Don't worry. I still believe in God. Okay. <laughs> I still believe that Jesus is my Lord and Savior and is the, the Son of God. So don't, don't worry about that. Don't worry about that. It's just that in my faith, there's been a different approach, really with fewer pieces of Christian doctrine, of Christian statements of belief that the church has proposed. I have fewer of those statements in the heart of my soul anymore. Um, and because a lot of the doctrine, a lot of the statements of belief, I just find unnecessary. And some of them just kind of downright silly. But that's me. That's me. So what's at the core of my being that has influenced my faith perspective and my preaching and approach to the Bible? To answer that, I need to share with you my take on the greatest story ever told. The Bible. Hmm. What if I told you there's just one narrative to the Bible? One main character and one main plot line. And every story that our ancestors in faith, and our Jewish brothers and sisters are our ancestors in faith, that every story they told, every commandment they chiseled or wrote in their hearts, every mile that Jesus and his followers trudged through uh, throughout Galilee and Jerusalem, and Jesus' and followers have trudged through, through to the ends of the earth. Every bit of that has been in support of one grand idea, one big idea. The main character, the protagonist, if you will, is God. Mm -hmm. And the plot line is God wins. And the one big idea is God does get everything that God wants. I, I'm just boiling it down to the most basic, okay? I view the Bible as one long love story. Sometimes sordid, other times beautiful. And the ups and downs that God has with the people he loves and the people God refuses to give up on. Mm -hmm. The story begins as all good love stories begin, you know, once upon a time or literally in, in scripture, in the beginning. And what follows in Genesis is an establishment of the setting that God establishes, heaven and earth, and the introduction of the protagonist of the creator of God, along with a cast of supporting characters Mm -hmm. basically all of us and all of creation. And it's quickly established that God is in charge of the whole enchilada that God has created and set into motion. And God knows how it's all supposed to work. And God thinks it's just terrific. He does. Oh, God is celebrating God's creation. It's also the case early on, though, that God's in chargeness, if you will, is challenged or disrupted. 
The world belongs to God and sings praises to God early on, but God is not a micromanager. That's my take on it. No, no. Thus, there are many opportunities for things to go wrong and go against the grain of what God wants for and from God's world. Mm -hmm. Beginning with, you know, those two in the garden, partaking of the fruit of the, the tree of knowledge of life and death, that they were told not to, of good and evil, of, of told not to partake of. <sighs> they wanted to have that knowledge. They wanted to be like God. They were really creating almost themselves a desire to be totally in control and idolize themselves. And things quickly went from bad to worse. The book of Genesis really is an unending story of unending fruit picking of the, from trees and fruit that we should not be partaking of and God essentially slapping our hand and us trying to figure out our relationship between God and with God's people. It's in the book of Exodus, though, where we find the underlying narrative for the entire Hebrew Bible, for all the Old Testament, for the Hebrew Scriptures, for that First Testament. Mm -hmm. In the Exodus, God's in a good old-fashioned, how do I put this, turf war with a powerful antagonist who is Pharaoh, the king of Egypt. And Pharaoh believes that the world is his hamburger. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which is something that empire builders tend to believe, that they can pretty much partake as they want of the world around them. And Pharaoh believes that, you know, he can take whatever he wants, including a labor force of enslaved people to build all that he wants to build, all this cool stuff, all these buildings and all these structures in a way to kind of mark his territory. God, though, has a keen ear, we understand in the book of Exodus, for suffering. He hears the cry of children under Pharaoh's power. And Pharaoh's enslavement of them leads the people to cry out, right? People suffer for many, many generations as a result. And these people who are suffering have lost sight that their ancestors, generations earlier, were tight with God. And God looks at this and thinks, this isn't how the world is supposed to run at all. This isn't what I was kind of really thinking about. It's not how it's supposed to roll. So God gets busy on planning the liberation of these people who were enslaved. And the message is sent to Pharaoh, let my people go. Let them go. And God, and Pharaoh is like, uh-uh, no, not doing that. They're my people. Can't have them. And God and Pharaoh wrestle, right? We know this story. And God stopped at nothing to show Pharaoh who's boss. God is willing to work it out initially here so that nobody gets hurt. Just let him go. But Pharaoh's not willing to do that because the go-to for Pharaoh is violence to get what he wants, to use his supposed, in his own mind, omnipotent power. Turns out, we see within God's character, hmm, to use violence to reorder creation as God intended it to, to be, um, God will, will resort to violence. We see here in scripture, struggle with that, figure that out. It's there, it's part of the story. God will do what God needs to do so that people are not being dominated by other people in this world. That is a baseline for God's relationship with us. And that anyone who wants to sit upon the cosmic throne that God sits upon, God is saying, mm -mm, my seat ain't sitting there. The end result, God gets what God wants. The liberated people are now known as God's people, right? And you spend the rest of Exodus, all of Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy 
with the people trying to get used to the understanding that in this world, God is in charge. We are not. And there's always a lot of pushback. They're learning from God during this time. Things like every seventh day, they're to rest. They're to have a Sabbath. They're not to work. They're not to always be working and worrying 100% of the time about things. Mm -mm. They are to rest. And rest, God is letting them know, is built into their calendar. Should be. For all humans, for animals, and yes, even for the earth itself, where on the seventh year, the land is to be, lie fallow to help it renew itself. This is what people are learning. This Sabbath rest reinforced that everything people have is of God's. No matter how hard you work at the sweat of your brow, ultimately everything you have is God's. And people learn to open their clenched this. And we're still trying to learn to do that because we like to do things on our own, right? People learn to open up their clenched fists and let go. And they're learning how to give some of their best stuff to God and to others. Hmm. They're learning to trust in God's provision and the people are learning to be generous. That once again, is a baseline in God's relationship with us. Share what you have with others. God offers direction. God offers commandments, 613 of them, by the way, in Scripture, to help people govern themselves, and especially, especially, a baseline here, to govern themselves, but especially take care of the most vulnerable, of the poor, of the widow, of the stranger, of the child. God puts into place these commandments to restrict also the powerful who want to, quote unquote, lord it over others. God is making really clear here. It takes a community. It takes a village to raise a child. You guys do life together. People are needing to learn to trust God who ultimately wants what is good for them. Hmm. Even though there's no roadmap to their journey, it's not like a clear roadmap, roadmap or knowing exactly what's, how it's all going to unfold, people have to find peace. God is wanting them to find peace. Even though they do not control their destiny, God does. Trust in that. Man, God's had a difficult time trying to get that across to them and to us still. Let God be God. That is really hard because we like to keep taking that fruit and being our own God. Hmm. It requires a lot of instruction. It requires a lot of practice. I like to think that we come here on Sunday mornings. We are practicing perhaps how we need to be out there. It's a learning curve, right? With a lot of mistakes. But it's all about the big, one big idea. Folks, you just got to give it up because God ultimately is going to get everything that God wants. Just the way it is. It's how it's going down. The Hebrew Bible basically tells this story. It's about the liberation of a small, disempowered people, tribes of Israel, and their eventual formation into a people made strong by being in a sacred relationship with their creator, a covenant with God, with the God of the universe. That's it. And throughout the Hebrew Bible, we see the importance of how it's important to remember how God delivered their ancestors from slavery. Deuteronomy 6.20. Keep teaching your children about this story, about how God delivered you out of bondage. Uh, several hundred years after Deuteronomy is written, there's Ezra in the book of Ezra, uh, the prophet saying, ah, remember, remember the Passover. Remember how God delivered you. And when the people of Israel came back from the Babylonian exile, they are told, reinstitute by God, reinstitute the Passover celebration. Share this meal that retells that story how God delivered our people from bondage. 
Throughout the Old Testament, poets and prophets speak of God as the Redeemer. Redeemer there in Hebrew meaning one who rescues you from captivity. Once again, a reference to the Exodus out of Egypt. And often the poets and prophets draw attention to God's mighty hand and outstretched arm, a phrase used over and over again in the Exodus story of how God delivered his people from Pharaoh. No matter what part of the Old Testament you're reading, no matter what part, this is my take on it, you're basically reading the Exodus story again and again and again. It underlies everything. God takes on pretenders to God's throne and God puts them in their place. God rescues a small and oppressed people. God shows a preferential option and sides with those who are most vulnerable. God forms this liberated little group into God's people, the people of Israel. And God promises to love and care for them forever. Hmm. Yes, God's feelings do get super hurt. They do. God comes across as having feelings and, and just being hurt, being angry often. When, but it only happens when God's love and care is just being rejected. What is the deal? Why do you keep reaching for that fruit? What is going on? I'm wanting to free you from that. I want to be your redeemer. The Old Testament, the Hebrew scriptures, the Hebrew Bible, the first testament, the overarching, overarching message, the Exodus is how we know who God is and will always be. Bam. What about the New Testament? Well, Pastor Steve, it's about Jesus, right? Right? Exactly. I ain't, I ain't, no, yeah, I'll agree with you on that. The New Testament introduces us to Jesus who celebrated the Passover, who understood the importance of that liberation of his ancestors out of Egypt is so central and foundational and fundamental to the relationship with God and how God treats them and cares for them and loves them and hears their cry and doesn't give up on them, no matter how, how much they may kick in their heels against God. Jesus of Nazareth, he was born in Galilee, northern present-day Israel. Uh, Galilee was one of thousands of provinces that Rome tried to control as they built their empire. Jesus' entire life was lived under Roman rule, with the Roman army occupying his land under Caesar's command. And the army enforced Caesar's ownership of the land and essentially of everyone and bankrolled Caesar's expansion by oppressive taxation. Taxation which could be as high as 80 or 85% of what you made. You give it around. It wasn't exactly the extreme of Pharaoh's enslavement centuries earlier, but it was pretty darn close, folks. The Roman law did not tolerate anyone threatening Caesar's throne, subverting Caesar's authority, and anyone wanting to compete with Caesar would be executed. And please hear me. It was the Roman judicial system that enabled a sham trial with perjured witnesses that found Jesus guilty and sentenced Jesus to death and executed him. It's made really clear in Mark 15. Yes, many Jewish leaders felt threatened by Jesus, his words and his deeds, but I must be very, very clear. The Jews did not kill Jesus, okay? Enough with the anti-Semitism. Enough. And the church has fueled it through the centuries. It was the Roman judicial system that decided Jesus' fate and the Roman police force that carried out the sentence. Simple, basic, 
This is what happened. Decades later, this is fascinating. If you look at the New Testament, look at this overarching message. Decades later, the early followers of Jesus, the early church, insisted, I find this fascinating, insisted, you know what? It wasn't Rome that instigated, instigated and killed Jesus. No, no. Because Rome, the early church decided, was too puny to be perpetrators of Jesus' death. Now the Jesus followers in the early church, they'd say it wasn't Rome. It was the great enemy death itself that carried Jesus into captivity, intending to enslave Jesus permanently into non-existence. You can see that in Acts 2, Romans 6, but this thought you see throughout the New Testament. Rome really acted as death's unwitting proxy. Hmm. At its most basic level, I guess you could say why Jesus died is because everyone dies, right? Everyone dies. But death has no hold on humanity like like a pharaoh or a Caesar, it can only pretend to do what it wants, take what it wants, and foolish enough to think it can't be beat. Don't ever tell God that you can't be beat. Don't ever pretend that the world is your hamburger. God will take that challenge and whoop your behind. That's what I see in the New Testament. Pharaoh, Caesar, death itself, and the systems that afforded them illegitimate power, God goes up against and simply declares victory. <laughs> you're, you're, you're toast. That's how this story goes, according to the Bible. In the case of Jesus, God takes one look at his son's lifeless body in a cold tomb and says, no, <laughs> not on my watch. Ain't happening. Ain't happening. No. So God calf ropes death, right? Jumps down from God's horse, ties up three of the legs of, of death, ties them all together and doesn't let, let death go until death surrenders. And God gives back what death stole from God. Life. We call it resurrection. Right? So the New Testament retells over and over and over again. The underlying theme retells the resurrection of Jesus. Even before his death, Whenever Jesus walked on water, or multiplied food, or healed people, or restored family relationships, he was foreshadowing resurrection. He was foreshadowing new life that was to come. Jesus, how do I put that? Because he's fully human, fully divine. Jesus was not bound to the natural laws of the universe the way the rest of us are. It just wasn't. When the early church turned the annual Passover festival that remembered, once again, God's delivering of God's people out of Egypt. When the early church turned the Passover festival into a frequent meal and celebration called the Eucharist, called communion, called the Lord's Supper, the early church said, we're doing this to remember that God delivers us. God is our redeemer. God delivers us out of captivity. And in our case, God is delivering us from death into new life. And that was celebrated and remembered at that table. We, and the church was very forthright. We are remembering Jesus and this new life and his resurrection. And we will remember all of this until our Lord comes back again. Jesus died, but he didn't stay dead. Hallelujah. Resurrection. Baseline for everything you read in the New Testament. 
The early church, and I'm beginning to wind it up already. The early church, early Christians, kept remembering how Jesus lived in the world. And they encouraged each other, the early church did, uh, the followers of Jesus, to be like Jesus. No matter the cost or the consequences. Because after all, God's got our back. That was the belief. Just like God had Jesus' back. That is resurrection. We can rise to a new way of life now. And experience that resurrection now. All of which is to say, God gets everything God wants. Exodus and resurrection are essentially the same plot line, but with different details. They're about deliverance to a new life, to freedom from something, be it enslavement, be it sin, be it death. Everything belongs to God. God, God has a way where God wants, and God knows how God wants all this to go down. If someone dares to compete with God for control of the show, God's mighty hand and outstretched arm, well, God will do his thing and God will win. So, Pharaoh, Caesar, death, they don't stand a snowball's chance in hell. Mm -mm. God gets everything God wants, so thanks be to God. And what is it? What is it that God wants? He wants you. Think of it. God wants you. Why can't we fathom this or grapple with it in the sense that, oh my gosh, I really am loved. God wants me. Okay? He does. He wants a loving relationship with you. God wants that loving relationship with all creation. It is a love story. So the challenge for us, as I ended here, if God wants to be in a loving relationship with us, if that is what God is passionate about, if that is what drives God, if that is what God is hungering for, what should be our response? Uh, I ain't telling you. Because that is between you and God. I'm not one who's going to tell you, do this, do that, or, or, or believe this, believe that. I'm not, that's not me. There are a lot of pastors up here saying, this is what you got to do. Mm -mm. That is between you and God. But you've got to know, and I will let you, God loves you, and he wants a relationship with you. And it seems to me a love story requires more than just one side. Just saying. So what should be your response to God's love? What you, should you be hungering for and desiring? If God hungers and desires for you as the pent ultimate essence of his love and heart, what should be your hunger and your desire and what fills you with passion? I don't know. A relationship of love kind of requires two at it, doesn't it? Something I want you guys to think about how to respond to God's love for you. Now I want you to talk to God about it. I really do. I... I I want you to do that thing called prayer. Who knows where it will take you? This relationship with God. Huh. Let's pray. Almighty God, Exodus and resurrection, you get what you want. Can it really be boiled down to that much? It's, it's a love story. We convoluted, we can take so many bunny trails with your living word that we kind of forget some of the basics that you want to deliver us from whatever it is that's keeping us from loving you. 
We have a lot of loves in this world, dear God. Oh my. We work for so many things and we think it's up to us. Ultimately, dear God, it's up to us trusting you. Doing the best that we can. Working hard, absolutely. But not trusting in that work. Trusting that you have given us the opportunity to do good things in this world. To establish a relationship with you. One that is receptive to receiving the love you have for us. Exodus. Resurrection. <sighs> Let us not overcomplicate this, dear God. Please give us clarity within our heart, within our mind of how to respond to your love. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen.